Welcome to On Life Health's webinar series. My name is Michael Detner and I'm your host. Today's webinar uh, is featuring your instructor uh, named uh, Jessica Henline, and the title of it is Powerful Habits, Breaking Bad Ones, Forming Good Ones, and Sticking With It. As I said, your instructor today is Jessica Henline. She is a health coach here at On Life. Uh, she is a graduate. Uh, she has a graduate degree in health education and promotion from Middle Tennessee State University and four years of experience as a health and wellness professor also at MTSU uh, and previous experience also before coming to On Life uh, as a health coach as well. And so without further delay, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Jessica. Thank you so much, Michael. Just a quick overview of what we will be discussing on this habit formation webinar. Uh, starting out, just some of the science behind habits and the role of the brain in particular in habit formation. Uh, we'll also discuss some common myths and misconceptions that are often associated with habits. Um, we'll also touch on a three-step process that's really common in habit formation that is called the habit loop. And also touch a little bit on why, in the case of habit formation, smaller can be big. And we'll, we'll wrap it up with some examples of common habits and, and some tips for changing specific behaviors. Okay, so starting out, a little bit of information with the brain. Uh, there's two core parts of the brain that are associated with habit formation. The first part is the basal ganglia and the second is the prefrontal cortex. So if you typically think of the basal ganglia as the habits and the prefrontal cortex as decisions. So um, the basal ganglia is just a collection of nuclei that are embedded really deep down in our brain. Um, this part of the brain is responsible for quite a few fairly fairly basic, when it comes to the brain at least, fairly basic behaviors. Uh, things like habit formation, memories, patterns, and things like that. And in, in just a second I'll have an example of, of driving with these two parts of the brain. Uh, the prefrontal cortex, uh, as the name implies, of course, is in the front of the frontal lobe of the brain and this part of the brain is is more complex it, uh, it it's responsible for things like decision making uh, thoughtful processes weighing consequences and just more executive functions so um, basically our brain really craves habits to save energy so we have have more time to either relax or uh, focus on making on the big decisions in life. So an example here would be the basal ganglia uh, and the habit would be driving your normal work, normal route to work every day. So oftentimes I drive from point A to B and I'm sure most people have and, and not really remember getting there because it's a habit. So in that case the basal ganglia is really at play. Um, driving with the prefrontal cortex. An example here would be just driving from point A to point B in a city you've never visited before. So you, you don't really know where you're going, you're paying very close attention, you're making decisions, and therefore in this, in this case the prefrontal cortex again is being used. So here's a little image. So like I said, the basal ganglia is kind of more basic um, habit formation, memories, patterns, and that's it down deep in the brain, that kind of gray, gray matter. And then, of course, in the front of the brain is going to be the prefrontal cortex. And that, again, is the part of the brain that is involved with more extensive decision making. Okay, so kind of going back to the driving example and also touching on neuron patterns, when we do something over and over and over, we really form these neural pathways in our brains. So think of an old habit as this easy, worn path, um, such as the path that you take to work every day, and a new habit as you know, kind of this unknown territory. It's going to be, you know, potentially difficult, unfamiliar, um, and it's going to have more obstacles. So obviously our brain wants to choose the habit that it already knows because it's easy and um, it, it just 
typically our brain already knows how to get there. So a few myths and misconceptions that, again, are often tied to habit formation. The first is going to be probably the one that most people have heard of, which is that it only takes 21 days to form a habit. Um, oftentimes people say 28. It really depends on who you're asking, but this is a really, really popular misconception. Um, I hear this frequently from members, and it, it really can play a big part in perceived failure. Often people think if they can't form a habit in 21 days that they can't form the habit, period, and it can lead to, to giving up. So there's really no solid number or way to calculate how long it will take. Um, every person's different. Every behavior is, is going to be different. Um, and it's also good to keep in mind that part of becoming healthier is changing our lifestyle. And this really, um, it's just not realistic for that to happen in three weeks. Okay, the second misconception is going to be that failure to change shows a distinct lack of willpower. Um, I would say it's very important to have willpower and motivation when we're making changes, uh, forming bad habits, uh, forming good habits, excuse me, or breaking bad habits, but that's not the key. Like we talked about with the, the brain and the brain's role in habit formation, there is so much more to forming habits than just wanting to and having the willpower to do it. And lastly, um, a, a big myth is that the bigger the habit, the better. Oftentimes it's best to start small, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but um, bigger is not always better with habit formation, and, and we often find more success when we start small and, and move, move towards bigger habits. Alrighty, so the three-step process that I mentioned previously is called the habit loop, um, and it it's discussed quite a bit in a book called The Power of Habit, which is written by Charles Duhigg, who is actually a award-winning New York Times business reporter. Um, he was so interested in the why and the how of habit formation that he he did a lot of scientific research and also um, looked at success stories from lots of different people, ranging from big business CEOs to Super Bowl winning head football coaches. And um, you know, he realized that this this three step process is very apparent in in most habits. So the first is going to be the cue. Um, which is critical because it really is just giving your brain a signal to kind of go into auto drive with a particular habit. Um, the routine is key because it's actually the habit itself. So um, it can be something physical, mental, emotional, but the, the routine is the habit itself. And then the reward, of course, is very important because it keeps us coming back for more. So the reward is what we look forward to when we are doing whatever the habit may be. Um, it's, it's what we get for, for participating and again, it's what keeps us coming back for more. Okay, so a little bit about forming good habits. Um, of course, it's really important to know what kind of habit and why, um, which, which makes sense, but um, you know, I, as I talked about with the brain before, the brain really doesn't know the difference between a good habit or a bad habit. So um, forming good habits is really similar to breaking bad habits. Uh, so we really need to, to dig deep and know what habit we're focusing on and why. Um, and once we, once we know what we want to work on, Planning and preparation really are key, just as with any other behavior change. Uh, planning and preparation are, are the most important part. So some, some crucial questions to ask yourself, of course, what habit and why. Um, is it realistic? Also see if you can find a cue that you can tie it to, and I'll discuss that a little bit when we talk about my story. And um, also, what obstacles can you foresee in the future? and go ahead and figure out kind of how you're going to work through them. And then also after the behavior, how are you going to reward yourself? Um, I think it's also important to remember with your reward, uh, try not to have it contradict your ultimate result. So an example here would be if you're 
trying to form a habit of exercise and the ultimate goal is weight loss, um, ideally the, the reward wouldn't be something like an entire chocolate cake. So uh, a little example of habit formation in my recent life. I've, I've recently started working a new shift and, and working later at night and everything is, is, is just so much different. So uh, I realized the first weekend after my new shift that I hadn't done any housework during the week and spent my entire weekend cleaning and I did not like that and I decided something needed to change. So I wanted to form a habit of cleaning during the week, at least a little bit every day. So I made a spreadsheet with a specific daily plan, daily cleaning plan and again the habit was to do one hour of cleaning every day. So the cue that I decided to tie my habit to was taking my daughter to school. I take her to school at 7 o'clock every single morning. So I decided that after taking her to school, I would do one hour of cleaning, whatever I'd specified on my, on my spreadsheet. And the reward would be coffee with new coffee creamer that I had bought. So again, the cue is taking my daughter to school. The routine uh, is one hour of cleaning immediately after taking her to school, and the reward is the coffee. And so far, I mean, it hasn't hasn't been too long, but so far it's going pretty good. I, I really allow myself to look forward to that coffee, and it kind of keeps me going and motivates me to get that hour of cleaning completed. Okay, so breaking bad habits. Um, because of the science of habits, like, like we discussed before, um, the brain really stops making decisions once the habit is formed and once the basal ganglia is kind of responsible for that behavior. So again, the brain really lacks the ability to differentiate a bad habit from a good habit, so you really have to make a deliberate decision to make a change. So, you know, take a look at your less desirable habits and figure out why you're why and what is causing the behavior and even what you gain from doing it. So um, it's really important when you're working on behavior change to try to replace instead of erase. And what I mean by that is keeping, keeping part of the habit loop intact. Uh, the cue and the reward ideally will stay the same and the routine, the habit uh, will change. So. Um, the, the reason for this is because the neural pathways in our brains that are formed by the habits, they never fully disappear. So if we're keeping part of the habit loop intact, uh, it's a little bit easier, easier to change that habit itself. So uh, quitting smoking, of course, is a very, very difficult thing to do. Um, and I don't, don't want to, this to sound like it's easy by any means, but this is just a little example of replacing a habit and keeping the cue and reward intact. So um, this example is quitting smoking with nicotine gum. Often smokers are triggered to have a cigarette when they have a, have a cup of coffee in the morning. So in this case, the cue is going to be a cup of coffee, and um, the reward is going to be having that, that little brush of nicotine in, in our system. So in the first instance with a smoker, the cup of coffee is the cue. The routine or habit is smoking the cigarette, and the reward is nicotine in the system. Um, and when we replace that routine, the cue stays the same. We still have the cup of coffee. The routine is now having a piece of nicotine gum, and the reward is still the same as well. We still have that, that nicotine um, in our system. So just a little bit of an example. But again, with the bad habits, it's important to make that deliberate decision. Look at your habits that you aren't a fan of. Why are you doing that behavior? What is causing it? Um, and then try to kind of find what you gain from doing it and begin working on finding a new behavior that can offer a similar gain. Uh, the reward isn't always going to be exactly the same, but finding something similar can, can be really beneficial. Okay, so going back to the myth of bigger is better, this is just a little bit about why small habits can really be, bring 
big success with habit formation. So the new year, new you is, is really focusing on the total transformation that people often try to make at the beginning of the year. Um, individuals often set resolutions. Uh, I'm guilty in the past as well. Um, set these resolutions at the beginning of each new year and often the goal, goal again is just total transformation. Lose X number of pounds, exercise every day of the week, quit eating sweets, quit smoking, eat smaller portions, the list could go on and on. Um, it's really quite difficult, you know, possibly even impossible, to change every habit overnight, um, much less a huge group of deeply ingrained habits. So um, it can be really helpful, again, to, to start small and build on that. Um, forming small habits, you go into the snowball effect, uh, they can successfully set the stage for repeated formation of more serious habits. So when we successfully form a small habit, it can actually begin a chain reaction and it also really helps build our confidence in our ability to succeed. So even with a with the formation of a small habit, so we want to exercise twice a week for 15 minutes, um, it can really build our confidence in our ability to succeed. Um, and it, it can also avoid taking hits to our self-esteem. Um, and going to learning from setbacks, uh, it's really important to remember in our personal life, as well as working with, with people forming habits, that setbacks happen and mistakes are made in, in every area of habit formation. Um, and the way that we recover from the setback is, is so much more important than the actual setback itself. So try, getting back up and, and continuing is so much more important than having, having something set you back a little bit. Um, and starting small really allows us to learn this lesson on a smaller scale, which, which can be helpful. Okay, so these are just some tips for common situations and just a, a few little examples of the habit loop when it comes to these, these situations. So the first one is actually, um, is actually going to be pertaining to social media. Um, this day and age, almost everyone is, is tied to at least one sort of, one social media outlet, maybe not all of them, but at least one. So, and not only that, but internet addiction can be a very, very serious and is a very real thing. So, um, in this example, I'll, I'll just go over a cue and a routine and a re reward. So uh, for someone who is maybe a little bit addicted to the internet or just has too much social media, um, the cue is going to be being in front of the computer. So something as simple as just seeing your laptop can often tell your brain that, okay, it, it's time to do this habit of of getting on social media. So the cue is being in front of the computer. Um, the routine in this case, again, is going to be just too much social media in general. So staying on, on Facebook or Instagram or all of the above for, for way too long. And the reward in our minds is keeping up with what's going on, staying in touch with friends and family, and, and just feeling like we know what's going on in general. So. An example of kind of working on changing this habit a little bit, um, again, with changing bad habits, trying to keep the cue and reward the same can be very helpful. So the cue is going to be being in front of the computer and, and seeing, seeing the computer there. Um, the routine, and of course this is where planning and preparation comes in, the routine is going to be a, a specified number of minutes that you have focused work to do. So of course you plan ahead of time and you know what work you want to do, um, if you want to check your email, if you have a project you're working on, but you have the routine or the habit is going to be a specified number of minutes on, on this focused work. And the reward will be keeping up um, with what's going on and staying in touch with family and or friends with an allotted number of minutes of social media at the end of your time on the computer. So five to ten minutes of social media after you've done this certain number of minutes on your focused work. And it, it may sound 
simple and, and almost silly, but changing the, these routines and keeping the, the cue and the reward intact is, is actually very beneficial. So a couple of examples with exercise. See here, like I said before, motivation does matter, but it's not the most important thing. Um, so a quick example for people who are wanting to get up and exercise in the morning, that's not necessarily realistic for everyone. Um, and there are so many obstacles that come between you know, individuals and their exercise goals. But uh, setting your shoes and your workout clothes beside your bed at night can be really important. When your alarm goes off and you see your shoes and clothes beside your bed, that is going to be the cue that it's time to, to get up and exercise. Uh, the routine is, going, of course, is going to be exercise, but it's important to remember here about starting small. So whether it's 10 or 15 minutes, um, whatever you feel is realistic, it's just going to be important to start small and prove to yourself that you can do this. And then over time, adding, adding more minutes or more intense exercise to it. And then the reward, um, outside of that rush of endorphins and increase in energy, can be um, really anything, again, as long as it's not majorly contradicting your ultimate goal. So fruit smoothie, a cup of coffee, whatever works for you and you feel will keep you coming back for more. And another example for, for someone who can't exercise in the morning but maybe would prefer exercising after work, um, I know from personal experience and talking to many people, uh, even if we have the best of intentions, getting home and sitting down on the couch can really um, affect whether we get out there and actually exercise or not. So uh, one important thing here is going to be changing the clothes before actually leaving work. So the cue is going to be clocking out. Um, and of course, changing into your workout clothes after you clock out. The routine, again, of course, is going to be exercise. So um, however that works for you, going to the gym, even going home and exercising. It may seem silly to change your clothes before you leave work just to go home and exercise, but it, it helps you avoid uh, the possibility of sitting down and not changing once you get home. So the routine, again, is exercise, and the reward, like I said before, can really be anything that you want, um, something that you decide ahead of time and that you feel like will, will keep you coming back for more, something that you can look forward to throughout your exercise. Okay, and a couple of dietary examples. Um, I think boredom is one of the biggest reasons that people overeat or mindlessly snack and this can be you know a big a big cause for weight gain or um, difficulties with weight loss because we don't really realize how many calories we're putting into our body so uh, in this case boredom is going to be cute the cue and then the routine is going to be mindless snacking and the reward essentially is just having less boredom and feeling like we we conquered that boredom um, with our mindless snacking so Coming up with a new routine, planning ahead of time, what you will do in the case of boredom is going to be key. So planning and preparing and deciding what, what the new habit can be. And this can be a variety of things. So once you feel that cue and that feeling of boredom, um, inserting another activity, whether it's reading a book or going on a walk or playing the piano, um, sending emails, just finding a new habit to place in there that will in turn uh, result in less boredom and hopefully be more rewarding as well. And an example with with McDonald's, often uh, times people see the, the big McDonald's M and immediately want you know, a Big Mac and fries, even if they're not necessarily hungry, because seeing that McDonald's sign reminds them of, of kind of that pleasure that they often feel from having the Big Mac and the fries and the, the salty, sugary, fatty foods. So here, of course, is seeing the McDonald's signs and you know, I think nationwide they all look pretty much exactly the same. 
probably for this reason. And uh, the routine is getting that Big Mac and fries or whatever unhealthy meal that you typically get. And the reward is, is going to be that, that pleasure um, that I think oftentimes the pleasure is mixed with uncomfortable feelings of fullness as well. So uh, in this case, seeing the McDonald's sign can can still result in, in a reward of, of pleasure, and you can still even stop at McDonald's. But uh, trying to plan ahead of time, even looking at the, the menu on the Internet and deciding that the next time you go, you will choose, you know, deciding what healthy options are there. And so you already know what you're going to order when you get there. So ordering that meal at McDonald's that has less fat or less calories, and at the end you'll still feel the pleasure of you know, not not being hungry. You'll feel the pleasure of of being full, but you'll also have the pleasure of knowing that you you chose a healthier option. And I think that is is just as helpful. So. All right, well, thank you so much for that, and I think, Michael, you have a couple of questions. Um, yeah, we do have a couple of questions, and I, I had a couple observations as well. Um, uh, very, very informative. Um, uh, first of all, uh, a question. Uh, could you uh, reiterate the, the title of the book and the author that you referenced earlier? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The title of well, the author, I'll start with that. His name is Charles Duhigg. I, I believe that's how you pronounce it at least. But Charles, and the last name is D U. H I G G, and um, that book that he wrote about habit formation is called The Power of Habit. I think there's a little subtitle, but the the main title is The Power of Habit. It's sort of become a classic, really. He, he for someone who's really not a behavioral scientist or a clinical person, he, he really kind of uh, really made some ground with that book. So oh, absolutely, it becomes very highly recommended. Um, uh, and thank you for that. I, I did have uh, just a couple thoughts as you were going through this. Uh, it was very, very thought-provoking. Um, when we were talking about the, the basal ganglia and the, uh, the prefrontal cortex, uh, I, I was thinking that the, ba the basal ganglia is almost, uh, the, the way you were describing it, it's almost sort of like a wild animal. It just wants to do what it wants to do. and it, It's kind of primitive, and it doesn't really have any discipline. It just wants to, to engage in the things that, that it's familiar with, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And whereas I was thinking, well, if that's the case, the prefrontal cortex, which is more sophisticated and, and much more, uh, more evolved, is almost like an animal trainer. So in order to, in, to really, really engage uh, uh, the changing of a habit, um, it's, it's, it's having discipline and control that originates from that trainer, from the prefrontal cortex, to kind of whip the, the, that more primitive basal ganglia into shape. Oh, absolutely. I definitely agree with that. And the basal ganglia, like I was saying, with the, the neural pathways, it's just like a, the easy road to take, and our brain likes that. Um, and our brain really craves those habits, so when we try to change them, it, it definitely takes a lot of motivation and training, I think. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking where the, the basal ganglia is concerned, uh, it responds to more simple things. And I was thinking as you were talking about different cues, uh, cues almost always, it seems, uh, in, involve our senses. You know, hearing a certain sound or smelling something or, or seeing a certain thing. You, seeing the keyboard, oh, I'm going to spend hours on that. Right, right. tasting the coffee and eating, you know, mm -hmm. feeling that you need that nicotine. Yeah, just like training an animal, right? Yeah. And so it seems as though the, the cue and the reward, the, those two pieces of the puzzle, are sort of the easy part for the basal ganglia. and. Right. The, the prefrontal cortex really goes to work with, where the routine is concerned. And, right. and I, I appreciate the fact that you mentioned how, how important it is to have a, when, when, you, when you're looking at doing a new routine, uh, having a plan in oh, place absolutely. in advance. Absolutely. Yeah, that was, that was uh, very, very good. And one final question, how is the house cleaning habit going for you? It's going pretty good. You know, every, every day isn't perfect, and I am, I'm happy that I've learned that uh, I don't have to be perfect three weeks into it, but it, it it's going pretty good, and I feel like day by day, week by week, it actually is getting easier, and I don't have to think, oh, I really don't want to do this. It's just took Brie to school, and now it, it's time to clean. That it, It's really feeling like more of a habit, and I know my husband's happy about that, too. 
<laughs> Very good. Well, thank you for your attention, everyone. Thank you, Jessica, for all the hard work you put in on this presentation. Uh, thank you for attending, and thank you for paying attention today. And also, please be on the lookout uh, for, for new and, and different On Life Health webinars coming up in the very near future. Thank you very much, and have a great day. Thank you.